Okie dokie, you are getting close to being done with the skeletal system. And what comes after the skeletal system? Well, the muscular system. And what better way to transition from skeletal into muscle than to talk about the joints, the articulations between bones, the things that allow us to actually move. So this lecture is all about joints. And uh, it actually, there's a lot of vocabulary involved that can get a little confusing, but we'll try to break it down. We'll see uh, some terms for different movements. Um, and all of this, if you learn it now, will help you when you study the muscles in a little bit. So let's get started, shall we? Of course we shall. Okay, so let's get started talking about joints. Again, this is all about joints. Joints, 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 joints. And in some books, you'll actually hear, instead of joints, they'll call the chapter articulations. It means the same thing. It's how we move our bones and muscles. And so movements actually occur across joints because our muscles via the tendons are attached to the particular bones across a joint and that will allow us to move bones in particular planes. Now we can classify these joints just like anything in anatomy and physiology. We can class them based on structure and we can also classify them based on function. Everything has a structure and a function, does it not? So we're going to start off with function. And in particular, that function is going to deal with mobility. So we are going to classify our joints based on their function as with regards to mobility, how they move. So when you think of joints, what kinds of joints do you think of? Well, you know, you can turn your head this way or this way or this way. All sorts of ways, right? You can even look at the ceiling. You can move your arm, your forearm up, your big arm up, etc. Now, of course, you can't see much of me in this little camera, fortunately, but um, otherwise I'd be up here and doing all these movements. But fortunately, I got some little videos to show you that will show you all these movements. All right, so we're going to be talking about the functional classifications of joints. So functional classification. And again, this is with regards to mobility. All right, so the first kind of joint is a joint that can move all over the place, like your arms, right? You can swing these things. Actually, your shoulder is the most movable joint in your whole body. You can swing your legs. You can move like this. You can move like that. So any joint that is highly mobile is a certain kind of joint. And we're going to call that a diarthrosis. So our first functional category is a diarthrosis, or diarthroses for plural. And in fact, I will just go ahead and change the color there. So we remember number one is a diarthrosis. So diarthroses are highly movable joints. Highly movable joints. Highly movable. That does say movable there, by the way. So some examples of this would be like your shoulder joint or your hip joint. So I put here a nice little picture of a shoulder joint. We're going to actually spend a lot of time on the shoulder joint, breaking it down, all the different parts. Um, it's actually a very fascinating joint because not only is it the most movable joint in the body, but it's also very unstable. People get their shoulders dislocated all the time. And so we're going to talk about all the different kinds of ligaments and, and parts of muscles and things that are in this joint to try to help stabilize it and keep it from popping out. All right, so highly movable joints are diarthroses or diarthrosis for singular. Now let's uh, go back to green and go to the second kind of functional classification here for joints. So if a diarthrosis was a joint that's highly movable, then we have another category for ones that are eh, kind of movable. They move, but not nearly as much as a diarthrosis. So an example of this would be, for example, this uh, vertebral column here. Your vertebrae, the joints between your vertebrae are somewhat movable, right? You can, you can bend your vertebrae, but not like you can your shoulder. So something that has some mobility, but not a whole lot, is called an amphiarthrosis amphiarthrosis. You've probably heard that term amphi before, right? Let me make that pink. Amphi, think of like an amphitheater. It's like 
part of a theater. So an amphiarthrosis has partial movement. Okay, so that's, that's how I'm going to define this here, right? I'm going to put partial movement, partial movement. And there are a lot of joints in your body that are amphiarthroses that have partial movement. Um, but the classic example is what we'll show here with your vertebral column. So that would be an example of an amphiarthrosis. And moving on down, we have number three. And these would be joints that are immovable. Or if they move, it's just like the teeniest, weeniest little bit. But for all intents and purposes, we'll say that they are immovable joints. These are called synarthroses. Synarthroses. Or synarthrosis for singular. So synarthrosis is basically an immovable joint. Immovable. Can't move. So common classic example of this would be your suture joints. Yeah, like in your school, right? You guys already learned about this. Here's your sagittal suture. There was your coronal suture. So these guys are synarthroses. They're joints. You know, they were formed by the fusion of bones, but you can't like move your parietal bone, right? I mean, that would be that would be pretty freaky. So yeah, you can't move the bones in your skull or the bones around synarthroses. So we have synarthroses all through our body, and uh, pretty much wherever there's a suture, that's a synarthrosis. So again, what are the three types? Highly movable, diarthrosis, somewhat movable, amphiarthrosis, and not movable, synarthrosis. So those are the functional categories. Now let's talk about the structural categories. And when you get into structural categories, it gets a little more complicated, but that makes it fun, right? Okay, so now that you know the three functional categories of joints, let's talk about the structural categories of joints. Okay, so now that you know the three functional categories of joints, let's do the three structural categories of joints. Of course, you're like, yes, let's do it. Structural categories of joints. Structural categories or classifications if you prefer. Categories. So the structural categories of joints. So there's three structural categories of joints and the last one we're gonna spend a whole lot of time on because there's so many of them in the body with so many different subclassifications. But the first one we're gonna talk about are fibrous joints. Fibrous joints. And so fibrous joints are characterized by the fact that they have connections between the bones that are made out of a certain kind of connective tissue you are familiar with, dense, regular connective tissue. So fibrous joints, and hey, why not make this rainbow and change the colors? These are um, joints that have connections between them that are made out of dense, regular connective tissue. So connections between bones made out of dense, regular CT, connective tissue. Dense, regular connective tissue. So um, there's actually three subcategories of this, so let's go ahead and change the color again. Um, within these, uh, you would have some of these fibrous joints, for example, with regards to your teeth inside your mandible. So what holds your tooth to the mandible. Well, you already know that we talked about alveoli would be the pockets, but what actually keeps the tooth in there? So if we come over here and we look at this tooth, okay, here's your tooth, right? There's your tooth, and here's the mandible, here's the bone. So something's got to anchor that tooth in there or it would just fall out. And so you have dense, regular connective tissue here in the form of ligaments. And that together, all that stuff together, if you take the root of the tooth, the ligaments, which is dense regular connective tissue, and the bone of the alveola, which is inside the mandible, you form what's called a gomphosis. Woo hoo hoo! So let's make our first subcategory for the tooth mandible joint. So tooth mandible joint, tooth mandible joint, and that is called a gomphosis. Think of like gums, right? Gums, gom, gomphosis. Boy, I cannot spell today. Gomphosis, gomphosis. So gomphosis is the connection, the joint, where the tooth is held to the bone, to the mandible, by way of dense, 
regular connective tissue uh, ligaments. So that would be one example. So I'll just put a little, I'll just put a little A here. Let's do another subcategory here, and these would be the structural category of fibrous joints that are sutural joints. So sutures. Okay, so we'll just put sutures. So we've already talked about sutures, right? You guys know that sutures are often found between bones and the skull, but elsewhere in the body, between the maxillae, for example. So these uh, sutures are a type of synarthrosis. We already said that, so they're a type of synarthrosis because they don't move. So sutures are synarthrosis. But the actual little fibrous connections between those bones are made out of dense regular connective tissue. And therefore, they also, in addition to being having a functional category of being a synarthrosis, they have a structural category of being a fibrous joint because they're connected by fibrous tissue, dense, connect, dense regular connective tissue. And moving on down, let's go ahead and come up with a third subcategory here. And these are called syndesmoses. Oh my goodness, syndesmoses. You're like, wait a minute, we already talked about synarthroses and now we're syndesmoses. Well, syn just means kind of joining or together. So think of synthesis, you know, joins concepts together. So synos, uh, syndesmoses are where there's a dense regular connective tissue membrane connecting bones. And so a common example of this, if you recall your tibia and your fibula, you remember this stuff right in between them? This was your interosseous membrane. Remember that? So let's make that our example here. Your interosseous membrane between your tibia and fibula, but it was also between your radius and your ulna, right? So that's a, it's a dense regular connective tissue membrane that's going to help to stabilize the joints between those bones. So that is another example of a fibrous joint um, that's where two bones are connected by dense regular connective tissue. So that's a syndesmosis. And it turns out that these interosseous membrane joints are examples of amphiarthroses. So the functional category is amphiarthrosis but the structural category is syndesmosis. All right, so what were the three kinds of fibrous joints? We had sutures, we had the tooth mandible joint, which was called a gomphosis. So we have gomphosis, sutures, and syndesmosis. So that is all, going back up here, see if I can go back up here. These were all fibrous joints, which is one category of structural joint. Let's, uh, switch gears and go to the second category of structural joints, which are cartilaginous joints. Okay, so you understand about fibrous joints, which is the first of three categories under the structural categories of joints. So let's go on to number two, which are the cartilaginous joints. So two cartilaginous joints. Cartilaginous joints. And you're like, okay, well, that sounds kind of obvious, right? So cartilaginous would be has cartilage. So indeed, we're dealing with joints where there's cartilage involved. Um, so these are connections between bones by cartilage. Connections between bones. And I'm going to say via just because I like that word via. It sounds Italian. Via cartilage. Cartilage. Car that does say cartilage. Okay, so let's think about what kinds of joints in our body we know have cartilage between them. Well, um, one you already learned about, so this guy down here, right? And it's even already boxed for you. So that, you will recall, is your pubic symphysis. So let's, uh, let's do some examples here. Um, so this actually, I'm sorry, this would be, let's cross that out, because this would be example number one would be symphyses. Symphyses. Symphysis or symphysis for singular. So the common example of this, so now I'll put my little EG for example, would be the pubic symphysis. Pubic symphysis. So the pubic symphysis is that little pad of cartilage. And do you remember what kind of cartilage it was? 
somewhere in that brain, I know you do, it was one of those rare examples of fibrocartilage. So it's a little fibrocartilage pad between the two pubis bones of your pelvis. And that is really going to help um, that area to be a little bit movable. But it also is serving as kind of a shock absorber, kind of some cushioning there. So it is a fibrocartilage. So let's remember that the pubic symphysis is a fibrocartilage joint. Fibrocartilage. Cartilage. So it is fibrocartilage, and uh, it's 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 a little pad, but there is some move, move, movability mobility, and therefore it is an amphiarthrosis. Amphiarthrosis. Okay, so that's the pubic symphysis. So symphyses are one example of cartilaginous joints. Um, you're also familiar with, of course, costal cartilage. You know this, costal cartilage joints are obviously found in your thoracic cage, your rib cage, and here's all that cartilage, right? So this is costal cartilage, rib cartilage, that joins the rib bones to the sternum, with the exception of ribs 11 and 12 that are floating ribs and they don't have any cartilage. So, uh, so these guys, the costal cartilage, is makes up another example of cartilaginous joints. Oh, um, Real quick, and sorry to do this, but let's go back to another example of symphysis because I forgot to mention the obvious example. Your, your intervertebral discs. Intervertebral discs. And we know that those guys are also made of fibrocartilage, and that was our example of an amphiarthrosis. So those are symphyses, but costal cartilage, I mean, this guy is in a category of all by himself because the only place where you find costal cartilage is in your thoracic rib cage. Okay, so um, third category of cartilaginous joints. I guess I really should be calling this A, B, and C, right? Just to stay consistent, that is a C. So the third category here would be the epiphyseal plate. And you're like, I remember the epiphyseal plate. Where did you learn about the epiphyseal plate? You learned about the epiphyseal plate when we were talking about growth of long bones. And so, down here, of course, here is the end of a long bone, and this right here is your epiphyseal plate. And so epiphyseal plate, you'll recall, is made, at least most of your life, is made of cartilage. It's hyaline cartilage, but it's cartilage, and it's actually a joint because it's kind of joining the top part of that long bone with the bottom part of that long bone. Um, so let's uh, make a note here that, indeed, it is hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage. And it is um, actually not movable, right? I mean, it's inside of your long bone. You can't move that <laughs> at all. And so what category of joint on a functional basis would that be? Of course, that's an example of a synarthrosis. So it's a synarthrosis, but it is also a cartilaginous joint. Um, but here's another vocab word to throw at you just because I know you're saying bring on, bring it on, give me more. So in terms of the bones that surround that epiphyseal plate, we're talking about a synarthrosis. But because we're talking about cartilage here, we can throw out another word and say ah, where you're talking about the cartilage, it's a synchondrosis. Syn chondrosis because we're talking about the immovability of the cartilage itself. Okay, so type 2 structural categories of joints, cartilaginous joints. What do we have? Symphysis, like the pubic symphysis, like the intervertebral discs that are made of fibrocartilage and our amphiarthroses. We have the costal cartilage that joins our ribs to our sternum, and you have the epiphyseal plate, which is hyaline cartilage, and it's immovable, therefore, it's both synarthrosis and synchondrosis. Whew, how are we doing here? I think you guys are doing great. I think you're ready for the advanced course, and that is the third category of structural categories of joints, and that would be synovial joints, and that's going to take up pretty much the rest of the lecture. All right, here we go. Okay, so we are ready for our third category of structural categories of joints. And so this is a great big number three because it's gonna, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about it. And these are your synovial joints. So 
So synovial feel joints. And here's the fun part. There are six subcategories of synovial joints. I know you're like, yes, bring it on. I just, I wanted more. Well, here you go. And here's a little summary picture that's going to go over these. So let's talk about these six categories, subcategories of synovial joints, and then we're going to break it down into exactly what a synovial joint is, what it looks like. But in a nutshell, with synovial joints, the bones don't touch. Bones don't touch each other. That's right. These bones don't touch each other because they got a nice little cushion in between them. And that little cushion is called the joint capsule um, and it's filled with a fluid called synovial fluid so we'll get onto all that in a minute but let's go ahead and talk about these six categories so we're going to say six subcategories of synovial joints synovial joints and i think it's awesome that we have six of them because that's more fun to learn so the hard part is trying to figure out when you know a particular joint in your, of your body, figuring out which of these six um, subcategories it fits into. Sometimes it's obvious, like in your shoulder, okay, it's really obvious. But at other times you're like, uh, wait a minute, how do I move my wrist bones anyway? Well, um, let us keep in mind that all synovial joints are considered to be highly movable and therefore they are all in the functional category of diarthroses. Okay, so all synovial joints are highly movable it's just how they move that differs. So first, let's talk about the multi-axial, multi-axial synovial joints. Multi, obviously that means many, and axial is axis. So think of planes of movement. You know, you're familiar with the sagittal plane, you're familiar with the coronal plane, but multi-axial means it can go in all sorts of different planes. And the most obvious of these would be as we already talked about, your shoulder joint, right? Your shoulder joint can go this way, it can go this way. I don't know if you guys can actually see my shoulder in the camera because I can't see myself when I'm recording this, which is probably a good thing. But you know, your shoulder can move all over the place in different planes. So can your hip joint, so can a lot of joints. And so the obvious example of multi-axial joints are ball and socket joints. Ball in and socket joints. And so we see a ball and socket joint down here. And it, lo and behold, gives you the example of a shoulder joint. So basically, you know, you can kind of you can kind of illustrate this with your hand, right? There's like a little cup and there's a ball. Socket, ball, ball and socket. And so because it's in a cup, it can go this way, that way, this way, this way. So I'm going to show you little videos that will describe these things to you. So that's a ball and socket, highly, highly movable. That is the most movable type of synovial joint. Let's go to number two. So number two category would be uh, biaxial. And that means it can move in two planes. So we have biaxial joints. And under, so this is movement in two planes. Two planes. And I guess I should point out with multiaxial, many planes. But you already know that because you guys are smart. So there's really two types of synovial joints that fall in this biaxial category. So I'm going to call these A and B so I can stick with my little nomenclature here. Um, so A is going to be what's called a condylar joint. And some books don't like to say condylar. Some books like to say ellipsoid, just to confuse you. And sometimes they say condyloid. We're going to call it condylar. So just keep in mind that a condylar joint is the same thing as an ellipsoid joint, so don't get confused there. Um, so we have a condylar joint, and the other type we have is the saddle joint because it's a lot like a saddle. So let's take a look at these. Let's start off with this ellipsoid or condylar joint here. So a condylar joint is where you're basically allowing for movements side to side or front and back. And so a good example of this is your metacarpal phalangeal joint. You're like, what? Metacarpal phalangeal joint? So you remember your metacarpals, right? One, two, three, four, five, those longer-ish bones making up your palm. And of course, your phalanges are all your fingers. And you have 
proximal, middle, and distal phalanges in fingers two through five. Well, that joint between your fingers and your palm, so between your metacarpals and your phalanges, that is, is a joint that will allow your fingers to move in two directions. They can go side to side and they can go forward and back. But they're not really rotating. You can't rotate your fingers like you do your arm. And so for that reason, it's biaxial. It's movement in two planes. Now, um, and let me go ahead and make a just a note of an example here, because that's kind of the, the classic one. I'm kind of running out of room here. But this is uh, between, for example, your uh, phalanges and your metacarpals. Carpals. Whereas your saddle joint, you find at your thumb. And so here is a saddle joint right here. Oops, I just covered up my thumb. Oh, well. But uh, for your thumb, it's basically between your carpal. Remember your trapezium? Of course you do. Your trapezium and your thumb. So right here, right? And so this allows your thumb to go side to side. It's kind of jerky, right? And forwards and backwards. But it's like a saddle. I mean, look at this. That looks like a saddle. Okay, so forward and back, side to side. So that is a saddle joint. Okay, so that is uh, the second example of a synovial joint. Let's move on down here because I can do that, which is cool on the software. Number three, what else do we got here? So those were our two examples of biaxial, but then we have very little movement in the third category because these are uniaxial joints. Uniaxial joints. And uniaxial joints only allow for movement in one plane. Movement in one plane. And so um, two kinds of uniaxial joints. So let's again call this A and B. So we have the uh, pivot joints, pivot and um, joint, so pivot joint. And we have a planar, sometimes called a gliding joint. Gliding joint. And so a pivot joint is where you're going to have a rotation pivoting around a certain point. So the classic example of this, remember the atlas bone and the axis bone of your cervical vertebrae? Well, that atlas bone sat right on top of your axis bone on the little projection called the dens. And that allows our head to rotate from side to side. So it can only go in one plane in that sense from, from that particular bone. That joint only allows movement in one plane. And so if we look back up here at the picture, they give another example of a pivot joint. This is a pivot joint. Um, and that is with the radius and ulna of your forearm. So that radius is actually going to rotate in one plane so that the head of the radius is going to rotate. So that is a pivot, and you can kind of see how it's showing you it can go that way or it can go that way. So, but I'm gonna say for our example of a pivot joint, we are going to talk about the atlas joining with the axis bones. And then for planar gliding, this would be like the least movable type of synovial joint. And uh, you see an example up here, like between your vertebrae, um, you also have this, for example, in your, um, in your carpals. So you're only going to get movement in one direction. So let's, uh, I'm going to give the example of your carpal bones. So example, carpal bones. Because you might not think about it, but your wrist bones actually can move. But they only move in one plane, and they kind of glide past each other. Okay, so we got uniaxial, biaxial, and multiaxial. Multiaxial example is the ball and socket. Biaxial is the condylar and saddle joints, and the uniaxial are the pivot and planar gliding joints. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to come down and we are going to kind of diagram what a sort of simplified, typical synovial joint would look like. And it's very cool because it has fluid in it, which is always very cool. Okay, so let's try a little diagram here. And I am the worst drawer in the world, but we'll be looking at some pictures of these anyway. So this is going to be my 
little diagram of a typical synovial joint. This, uh, for example, might be your knee or something like that. So let's, uh, let's take some blue here and let's just pretend we had two long bones. This is some long bone, maybe it's a femur, uh, simplified. And some other bone that it's meeting up with, maybe this is a tibia. Wow, that's a really ugly tibia. But these bones, if, if there is nothing cushioning between them, these bones would grind up together and that would not be good. We would not be able to move for very long if that were the case. So we got lots of cushioning in there. Um, and you know, the cushioning by itself is not gonna make that joint very stable. So it's gonna have some help. It's gonna have help from ligaments and tendons and all sorts of cool stuff. So this guy's actually gonna have a capsule around it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this capsule in another color. So here's a capsule. And here's the other side of the capsule going this way. So we are going to call this the joint capsule. Okay, so that's the joint capsule. And that joint capsule on the inside is lined with a membrane. Of course, everything is lined with a membrane. You already figured that out by now. So I'm just going to make this a little bit thicker. Actually, why don't I just go ahead and change colors? So I'm going to just kind of write a thin little line. See how accurate I can make this here. I'm going to line this little joint, joint capsule with a membrane. And so this membrane, I'm going to call the synovial membrane. Synovial membrane. And you guys know that when there's a fluid inside something, that fluid has to be produced by something. So for example, remember we talked about mucin and the mucin was produced by ah, the goblet cells. Well, cells are going to produce a fluid that's going to kind of fill up this joint capsule and make it nice and cushiony like a bubble. Or think of this as like a water balloon, right? <laughs> What's making the water? Well, the cells along the synovial membrane are going to make that fluid, and they're also going to absorb back that fluid, and that is called synovial fluid. So that synovial fluid is going to provide, you know, kind of like, it's like a shock absorber. It's also going to deliver nutrients to the cartilage that's, uh, overlying the bones, which we're going to talk about in a sec. Um, and then around that synovial membrane, so that's really thin and fragile, but on the outside we have something tough, because we got to be tough. And so that is going to be called our, our fibrous layer. So I'm going to go ahead and go make it kind of thick to show that it's fibrous. That's going to go along here. I love colors. Okay, and it's going to go along here. Of course, it's touching that, which I'm not showing. Okay, so that right there is called the fibrous layer. And of course, it's connective tissue, so that's a fibrous layer. Um, I guess I should probably fill in the inside so that we know that that synovial fluid is filling up all this stuff in here. So that's all synovial fluid. I guess I should label it synovial fluid. And that's not all. So that fibrous layer is kind of your first line of defense to kind of anchor in that, that joint capsule. So we got this connective tissue fibrous layer, nice and sort of solid around there. But that's not enough to stabilize these guys. We're going to have some other things. Well, first of all, internally, we're going to have some cartilage. And so that cartilage is just going to kind of line the ends of these long bones. And you guys are already familiar with this. What kind of cartilage is it? Well, it's made of hyaline cartilage, but because it's between the articulations of these bones, we're going to call it articular cartilage, but it is made of hyaline cartilage. So I'm going to draw an arrow there, and that's hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage. Um, but it is called articular, articular cartilage. Okay, so that's our articular cartilage. But then that's not enough. And well, what does that articular cartilage do? Oh, we might as well say the function here. It cushions. Because these bones never touch. In a synovial joint, the bones should never touch each other because of the fluid. You know, it's kind of like if you took a nice big thick water balloon and you put your two fists going, rrr, rrr, there's fluid in between. So they kind of move, they glide, but they shouldn't, unless you go really hard, they shouldn't actually butt up against each other unless there's some kind of trauma. Well, just in case there is, we got this 
this articular cartilage here and that'll help help these guys to reduce the friction if they do happen to touch but we need some more stabilization which means we need more colors here so let's get another color here um, surrounding that fibrous capsule we're going to have ligaments all these synovial joints have all sorts of ligaments some of the which we'll be learning the names of others <laughs> i give up there's just too many to learn so let's uh, go ahead and start wrapping this guy we got some some ligaments here okay so there's ligaments here and there are all sorts of ligaments they're not all in one direction but we're just gonna illustrate them for simplicity's sake like this so that would be some ligaments i remember ligaments connect bone to bone but they help stabilize that joint capsule right there and then finally and maybe i actually should have done this in <laughs> red but i didn't so uh what color have we not used yet uh, pretty much use all colors here maybe i'll go back to blue let's see oh we haven't used dark blue okay you also of course on top of all this have muscle and muscles are connected to their bones by way of tendons you guys know this right so for example if this was a joint capsule of uh, you know between your forearm and your upper arm then you know one of your big muscles here mine's so big uh, biceps brachii right and biceps brachii has these beautiful tendons that come off of it and insert on two features landmarks on the bone across the joint so let's pretend that we had a big muscle over here maybe this is the biceps brachii maybe it's a quadriceps whatever so there's your muscle and you you know actually the muscle would probably extend down but after a while it's going to be a tendon that's going to insert on the other bone and you know maybe you have a, another one over here so this is just kind of generalized. You'll be learning all these in just a little bit in the, in the muscle unit. So I'm just going to put tendon here because the tendon will be yet another way to stabilize this joint. Okay, so that's kind of a generalized um, view of a synovial joint, but there's so many details depending on what joint you're talking about. Um, we're not going to learn all the details, but we're going to learn some of them. So what I want to do now is start going through joint by joint and talking about some of the key features and then we're going to actually watch some little videos that will explain these and of course do some virtual dissections on AP Revealed because no AP lecture is complete without AP Revealed. All right, so let's let's take a look at that. Okay, so we're going to talk about several of these joints, but let's start off with the most complicated one, right? I mean, might as well get that one out of the way. And that is your knee joint. And if you know anybody who's ever had knee surgery, my, my mom actually just had some knee surgery and I mean, it is not an easy process. You're talking about some major surgery and some major recovery time afterwards. You know, there's people that have to get full knee replacements. So your knee is constantly receiving trauma from gravity, from kicking, from, you know, all the things we do. It's, it's kind of supporting most of our body weight if you think about it. So knee joint has to be very complicated. It has to be very, very reinforced in order to keep bad stuff from happening to it. So when we're talking about the knee joint, and I'll just make a note here that this is the most complicated of the joints we're going to talk about. Uh, most complicated, and of course it is a synovial joint. But we're talking about basically three bones involved. The main one, which you will remember, is your thigh bone, is your femur. But we also are talking about a joint between your femur and your patella, which is your kneecap as well as your femur and the tibia. We're not really talking about the fibula here. The fibula is not really actively involved in the knee joint. It's these other ones here. And just a little note about the patella here. Patella is a very interesting bone because it's embedded within a tendon. So it's embedded. It's actually embedded in the quadriceps tendon. So the quadriceps are actually four muscles in your, you know, you know your quads. If you go to the gym and you extend out your leg, you're working your quadriceps. Well, there's big set of tendons that come off of there, and the patella bone is just right smack in the middle of that. But then kind of part of that towards the end is a ligament that it's kind of the patella's own ligament, and it's called the patellar ligament. So um, the quadriceps muscle, and it, as we start talking about these joints, we're going to start to need to talk a little bit about muscles, which is fine because you're getting ready for our muscle unit anyway. So let's go ahead and 
and talk about the quadriceps. So four muscles, you'll be learning those. Don't worry about the names of the individual muscles that make up the quadriceps right now. But the quadriceps, because they are involved in the knee joint. So let's go over here and put quadriceps. That means four heads, like a, like a monster. Uh, so the quadriceps muscle, I guess I should stick muscle in here. So the quadriceps muscle is actually going to cross over this knee joint and it's going to attach onto a little feature of the tibia. It's going to actually attach to the, attach to the tibial tuberosity. Ah, oh, you learned the tibial tuberosity. You remember that little guy sticking out of there? Well, bumps on bones are for attachment of muscles for via the tendons. So that's important. Let's um, let's draw a generalized, you know, again, simple, I cannot draw kind of diagram of a knee joint. And then we're going to actually look at a real knee joint and do some dissections on it. So let's just draw a generalized knee joint here. So, you know, we're talking about your femur here. And you'll remember that there's femurs, uh, the femur has, you know, condyles here, it has a little fossa, and most of it is going to articulate right onto the tibia of the lower leg. And you'll have your fibula kind of out here somewhere. Think of fibula like fiber. It's a really skinny bone. Well, this, again, this knee is under constant trauma, under constant pressure, and so it really has to get stabilized. And when someone tears a ligament of the knee, it is not going to be a fun field day because you want those ligaments intact to stabilize this joint. And so there's some really important ligaments here. So I'm going to draw one going kind of like this. Okay. So this is a ligament. And then there's also one flanking to the side over here. Okay. So these are ligaments, and they're called collateral ligaments. In this case, collateral kind of means off to the side. Think of casualties of war, right? They say collateral damage means kind of the damage that's off to the side, sort of subsequent to the cause. Um, so the one that's attaching to the fibula is going to be called the fibular collateral joint. Fibular collateral joint. And that's uh, going to be, you know, if you're looking anterior, which is kind of what I'm trying to draw here, um, that's going to be uh, lateral. Okay, so that's lateral. And then on the other side, joining to the tibia is, you guessed it, your tibial collateral joint. Or, sorry, tibial, did I write joint? It's one of those days. Fibular collateral ligament. Why did I write joint there? I don't know. And this would be tibial collateral ligament. Not joint, ligament. There you go, Brie. Okay, so it's a ligament. And that, you know, facing anteriorly would be on the medial side. So those are two really, really important ligaments involved in the knee. Now there's a lot of ligaments involved with the knee, but I want you to know the collateral ones and the other ones that I want you to know are the ones that crisscross right smack in the middle of the sky. These are very interesting and a drawing won't do this justice. You gotta see a picture, which I'll show you in a minute. And they're basically going to go, eh, ish, like that. <laughs> and these are called your Hold on, let me bring this screen down here for a sec. So these are going to be called your cruciate ligaments. Cruciate ligaments. And cruci here means cross because they cross. And the interesting thing is one goes from anterior to posterior and one goes from posterior to anterior. So let's take a look at these here. Um, I'm not going to even label, well, I'm just going to put cruciate ligaments here. And uh, because it, I can't really draw them the way they actually look with one going from back to forward and one going forward to back. Hard to do that in a two-dimensional di two diagram, but I am going to go over here and write them out. So we're going to have an anterior cruciate ligament. And the anterior cruciate ligament is going to attach from the anterior part of the tibia to the posterior part of the femur. So we're going to say attaches from anterior tibia to posterior femur. 
And then over here, I'll write posterior cruciate ligament. And this guy is going to be the opposite, right? He's going to attach from posterior tibia, posterior tibia, to anterior femur. So think about that. If you have one going from the front of one bone to the back of the other bone, and the other one going from the back of the bone of that other bone to the front of that bone, I mean, that's giving it some nice stability smack in the middle. So all of that is really, really important. It's going to really help. So you got the collateral ones on the side. You got the cruciates in the middle. And uh, the other thing you're going to have that's going to help with all this, and I will, eh, I'll make it in red. You got little pads under here. So the pad there and the pad that. And we've talked about these pads already. So I will write the red over here. So these little pads. These are made of fibrocartilage. And these little pads are called menisci. Menisci. Or meniscus for singular. So they're little pads. And these pads are in the knee joint. They're not in most joints. They're in the knee joint and they're going to kind of be little wedges that are going to help to have that knee kind of be able to go forwards and backwards. You know, and it gives it a little extra padding, a little bit of shock absorbance. Um, and we're going to have a medial one and a lateral one. So I forgot to mention the knee joint is an example of a hinge joint. It's a hinge joint because it can go, you know, basically through one plane. You don't want to overextend your knee, of course. All right, so that is the basics of the knee joint. Let's go ahead and take a picture of it, take a look at it. Let's do a virtual dissection, shall we? Of course we shall. Okay, so let's get a general uh, sense of synovial joints by way of a little video here that will explain it. And, um, and then we're gonna start going over some dissections and taking a look in more detail at each of these kinds of joints. A joint is an articulation between bones. Synovial joints, the most common type of joint, show a wide range of form that determines range of movement. Synovial joints, such as the elbow, are relatively simple and permit movement in a single plane. Others, such as the shoulder joint, allow for complex movements in multiple planes. There are six types of synovial joints, each distinguished by the shape of the articular surfaces and planes of movement. In descending order of mobility, they are ball and socket joints, such as the glenohumeral joint of the shoulder, condyloid or ellipsoid joints, such as the metacarpophalangeal joints, saddle joints, such as the trapeziometacarpal joint of the thumb, plane or gliding joints, such as the intercarpal joints, hinge joints, such as the humeral ulnar joint of the elbow, and pivot joints, such as the radial ulnar joint of the elbow. A typical synovial joint is characterized by a joint or articular capsule lined by a synovial membrane, a joint cavity, and articular cartilage covering the contact surfaces of the bones involved. The joint capsule is a connective tissue cuff that encloses the joint cavity. The joint capsule has two layers. A thick outer fibrous layer attaches to the articulating bones. Frequently, accessory or collateral ligaments and tendons reinforce the fibrous layer. The delicate inner layer of the joint capsule is the synovial membrane. It produces and absorbs synovial fluid, a viscous substance that lubricates and nourishes the articular surfaces. A layer of hyaline cartilage, known as articular cartilage, covers the surfaces of adjoining bones. The combination of synovial fluid and smooth articular cartilage provides a low resistance surface for joint movement. Some synovial joints have fibrocartilaginous specializations. An example is the meniscus of the knee joint, which deepens the articular surfaces to increase joint stability and efficiency. 
It also acts as a shock absorber. Joint specializations such as bursi reduce friction between structures that cross a joint. For example, bursi in the shoulder lie between the joint capsule and several associated tendons. Okay, so that video's diagram was way better than mine of a synovial joint. All right, so now we're going to try our first actual virtual dissection with AP Revealed. We'll be using a lot of this when we get to the muscles, but it's really cool actually to study some of these joints using this. Um, pretty fancy. So this is these are actual cadavers that we're going to be dissecting here. So um, what I have this on is uh, go to all content under skeletal. Uh, make sure you click on dissection, and I have this knee joint. And it gives you the option to do the anterior knee or the posterior. I just went ahead and selected anterior. And uh, notice that it gives you the skeleton, surface, anatomy, or other. You can just leave that blank for now because what we're going to do is we're going to start peeling back the layers of this knee. So obviously we're at the surface here, including the skin. Um, if you want, you could click here to tab different things. I mean, it's just going to tell you, okay, that's where the surface projection of the patellar ligament would be. Um, that would be the surface projection of the tibial tuberosity, but we don't really need that right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to just start, we're going to hold down our left mouse key and we're going to start pulling this down. And you'll be able to see that we're actually peeling the skin off and seeing what's underneath. And uh, this gets pretty cool. Um, we can't see much of the joint right now. We're basically looking at, at subcutaneous tissue right here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and keep peeling it down. So I'm going to peel down the second layer, and now we can start really seeing this knee joint. How cool is that? I mean, right here we have the patella bone. So let's go ahead and turn on some of our layers, and you'll see I can highlight that. That's your, your patella. But check it out. I mean, you see, remember the menisci, those fibrocartilage pads that are there? There they are, and they're beautiful. There's your lateral meniscus right there. So it's made out of fiber cartilage. There's your lateral meniscus. So if that's lateral, and I'm looking at the anterior view here, am I looking at the left leg or the right leg? Well, think about it. It's anterior and that's lateral, therefore I must be looking at the left leg, right? Left, left. Okay, so, um, and if I click over here, there's my medial meniscus. So this is on the medial side. This is on the lateral side, but those are my menisci. And what do we have here? Ah, what do we have? Of course, what do we have? We have our collateral ligament. So if that's the lateral side, we know that this collateral ligament is attaching from the femur to the fibula. So this is our fibular collateral ligament. Absolutely, which fibular makes the one on the other ligament. side your tibial collateral ligament. How beautiful is this joint right here? So cool. And so there's the piece of your patellar ligament. Obviously it's been uh, cut right there. So you're just looking at a piece of it because they otherwise you'd be covering up what you're trying to see. And um, there's another little ligament right under here called the transverse ligament of the knee, which means horizontal, right? It's going across, but I'm not going to make you learn that one. All right, let's peel back another layer, shall we? Let's, why not? Let's keep peeling it back. Oh, look how cool this is. You can go straight down to the bone, but if you stop halfway, this is so cool because you can kind of actually see the previous layer superimposed on the layer underneath. So you can really kind of see how all this fits together. I just love this stuff. I mean, maybe it's just me, but I just think this is the greatest thing since Swiss cheese. Okay, um, so, you know, when we're pulling down to this third layer here, you're still seeing the menisci, you're still seeing the collateral ligaments, but now you can actually distinguish between the fibula and the tibia, and you're starting to see some of the features inside the, the femur itself. So, um, so let's turn on a layer there. So obviously this is your femur bone up there, which would make this your tibia. So again, notice that the fibula does not actually make up part of the knee joint, only the tibia does. But there's your fibula. And right here, so this is your articular surface of your femur because this is going to be what, what kind of rocks, what articulates with that tibia. And it's going to be covered with hyaline cartilage, articular cartilage, because you need to make sure it's smooth. And you still have your menisci here. You know, there's your lateral. And then um, here is that first 
cruciate ligament we were talking about. This is a piece. You can only see part of it right now. But this is your anterior cruciate ligament. So remember, that is going from the anterior tibia, so it's actually going to cross under this other one and attach to the tibia, to the posterior of the femur. Whereas here is your transverse ligament. So it's kind of covering part of your anterior cruciate ligament. But that's okay. When we go down another layer, we'll see it again. So let's go down another layer. And now we can really see this cool stuff here. So what's, um, I mean, look, these guys are little crosses right here, these, these cruciate ligaments. So let's go ahead and label them. So now you can really see how the anterior cruciate ligament goes from the anterior part of the tibia and attaches in the back, the posterior part of the femur, versus over here is our posterior cruciate ligament. So we're going from the posterior part of the tibia to part of the anterior of the femur. How cool is that? Okay, so there's your articular surface of your femur. And what do we have here? You remember these features? Of course you do. Your medial condyle of your femur and your lateral condyle of your femur. And again, we got articular cartilage here. I mean, these guys are articulating with that head of that tibia there, the top of the tibia. And there's your epicondyle. Remember your medial epicondyle? How cool is that? What do we got here? Ah, there's that tibial tuberosity. So that's what your quadriceps tendon is going to actually come down and attach to that tuberosity because that's what bumps do. They attach to things. And over here is your head of your fibula. So bumps are for attachment. How cool was that? Let's go in reverse. Let's build it back up. Adding in our collateral ligaments. Add in our patella and all the stuff covering it, and now you have a perfect knee. Okay, so that was the knee joint. Now we're going to go back to Smooth Draw, which is my writing tool, and we're going to learn about the shoulder joint, and then we'll come back, shall we? Of course we shall. Okay, so we are ready to tackle the shoulder joint, and again, the shoulder joint is the most movable joint because it can move in all sorts of different planes. It is multi-axial but therefore it is not stable. So it's gonna need lots and lots of help to keep from dislocating because dislocation uh, injuries, rotator cuff uh, industries, injuries are very, very common and uh, need for a lot of surgeries <laughs> is due to dislocation of shoulders. So uh, when we're talking about the shoulder joint, we are pretty much talking about just two bones involved here. So we have our humerus, you know, which of course you know is your upper arm bone and we're talking about its articulation with the scapula scapula is just one of my favorite bones there are so many awesome features to it which you've learned and just it just does so much you know it, it's pretty much responsible for so much of the movements that we do in our upper body now when we're talking about the humerus we're mainly going to be talking about the head with respect to the shoulder joint whereas the scapula we're mainly talking about the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa remember that glenoid cavity glenoid fossa so uh, if you can look at this picture here so here is the head of the humerus and it's articulating right into the glenoid fossa of the scapula so um, we're going to try to break this down, but we're going to do a virtual dissection. Um, I think that will actually help even more. So, um, you know, basically your glenoid fossa is like an ellipse. And this head of the humerus, you know, this is a ball and socket joint. And so it's going to need lots of stability. So there's tons of ligaments involved with this stuff. Ligaments, tendons, and of course, we're going to also have cartilage involved. And, you know, pretty much as much as you can think of could possibly help stabilize this joint. And, of course, there's a joint capsule in the middle. So let's just draw kind of a generalized, very simplistic diagram here, and then we'll, we'll break it down. So imagine this curvature here is the head of my humerus. So that's the head of humerus. And then up here would be my glenoid fossa, my glenoid cavity of your scapula. So that would be your glenoid fossa or cavity, however you prefer. I like, I like using fossa. And of course, this glenoid fossa is going to be lined 
with articular cartilage, hyaline cartilage. So that is hyaline articular cartilage. And of course, what are we going to have smack dab in the middle? Our joint cavity filled with synovial fluid. So all that right there would be our joint cavity. Joint cavity filled with synovial fluid. And you already know the deal, right? There's a, there's a synovial membrane that's producing the fluid and absorbing it, and there's a fibrous capsule on the outside. And the other cool thing is, and I don't know if you can really see it here. Maybe you can see it. There actually is a little lip right here. Let me make that in a different color. It's a little lip. And that little lip is going to be called the glenoid, glenoid labrium, that which means lip. Labrium. It's the glenoid labrium. It's just a little projection and yet another way to help stabilize it. So this guy is going to have tons of ligaments. And in fact, let's let's just I'm just going to mess up my drawing here. I'm just going to go just to illustrate that there are many ligaments around this thing. Many doesn't look like it says many, does it? Many ligaments to stabilize. Now here's one of the other things that we're going to see, and you'll see this on our virtual dissection, which is just absolutely beautiful. There is going to be, well, you know, we're talking about the humerus. Well, the principal muscle, the main, at least the main anterior muscle on our humerus is the biceps brachii. You know, your biceps this is what you do your bicep curls with, right? Well, that biceps brachii is actually made of two heads. So we have to go in here and introduce another muscle. Why not, right? So again, we're starting to ease our way into the muscle unit. So let's talk about a principal muscle in here that's involved with stabilizing this sh uh, shoulder synovial joint. And that is your biceps. That means two heads, just like quadriceps meant four heads. Biceps means two heads. Biceps brachii. And there's a long head of the biceps brachii. And there's a short head head of the biceps brachii. Well, what we're really interested with regards to the shoulder joint is this long head because there's this tendon that is going to come off of the long head of the biceps brachii. So it's down on the humerus and he's going to actually go up a groove. Remember, remember that groove that goes up the anterior part of your humerus? Do you remember this? So remember near the head of your humerus, you had a greater tubercle? And a lesser tubercle and a groove in the middle intertubercular groove well that turns out that groove is there because of the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii and that tendon is going to come up and it's going to go over that shoulder joint and it's actually going to insert on the superior part of the glenoid fossa and so it's a stabilizing mechanism how beautiful is that and I will show this to you on the virtual dissection because I just think that is so cool that our bones have these features just sitting there waiting to accommodate things coming off of our muscles. I, I just think it's beautiful. But again, I'm a nerd. So anyway, um, let's take a look in a little bit more detail of this, but um, I guess I should just make a note here so we don't forget that what we're talking about here. So um, yeah, I'm kind of running out of room here, but let's just say uh, long head, of biceps, I'll just abbreviate biceps instead of biceps brachii. It's going to have a tendon that is going to help stabilize this shoulder joint and it's going to lie in the intertubercular groove of the humerus and I'll, I'll show that to you. So shall we? Shall we go do a virtual dissection? I think we shall. Okay so we are here looking at our shoulder joint and the fancy name for the shoulder joint is the glenohumeral joint because it's the joint between the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the humerus of the upper arm. So glenohumeral joint aka shoulder joint. And so we have here a cadaver with um, or at the skin layer. So we're going to start uh, pulling this down. This is the anterior view, so we're obviously looking at the left shoulder. And we're going to start peeling this back. 
and you can start to reveal some of the muscles which you'll be learning about very soon and you can see all the all the subcutaneous tissue there um, and I mean you're gonna learn all that stuff so let's keep pulling it down to another layer so that we can start to kind of see some of the joint there so what do we see here we see the fibrous capsule that's surrounding this shoulder joint here this glenohumeral joint but let's pull down one more layer I lied maybe two more layers let's, let's go ahead and pull down two more layers there we go and this is what I wanted to show you so that right there is that tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii so you can see where it's coming up from the biceps brachii crossing that shoulder joint and inserting up on the superior part of the glenoid fossa so let's see if we can turn on some layers there so if I highlight that you can see tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii muscle Tendon so it is not only going muscle. to help with the movement, you know, the flexion of the arm, which we'll be talking about the types of movement in just a little bit, but it is going to stabilize. It's going to help stabilize that joint so that the head of the humerus doesn't just pop out of that glenoid fossa. What else do we have here? So here is the fibrous capsule of the joint. You can see it's kind of just surrounding there, stabilizing the joint. Um, here's some more ligaments, so lots of ligaments here. These are the glenohumeral ligaments. Um, here is a ligament that was cut here. So you can see this cut coracohumeral uh, ligament. So obviously that's going to attach to the coracoid process, the crow's beak. Um, anyway, we could go on and on and on, but I think let's not. Let's keep digging down. Aha, now we get to the bone. So see this? See how the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii sits right into that intertubercular groove of the humerus. I just think it's beautiful. It goes right between the greater and lesser tubercles of the humerus. So let's keep, keep bringing it down. So now I've actually taken that tendon off, but I mean, look, how, look how it fits in there. I just think it's beautiful. All right. So now we can see the humerus. Here's the head of the humerus. And you can see it fitting right into that glenoid fossa right there. So let's turn on our tags. Again, there's your whole humerus right there. Here is the surgical neck of your humerus. See, these are all landmarks you remember. And there's your intertubercular sulcus or intertubercular groove, however you want to say it. That's where that tendon goes through. There is your greater tubercle. There is your lesser tubercle. And here, of course, is the anatomical neck of the head of the humerus and there well there's the head but right behind it is the glenoid fossa and of course all this is your scapula up here with your coracoid process and you have your of course your little acromion over there and that's part of your actual clavicle which is not involved in this joint at all um and your sub uh, suprascapular notch so you'll you know, there's a reason why we're studying all these features because they're all important in these joints which are all important for movement okay so there's a your nice shoulder ball and socket joint right there all right um not done yet because the other things that are going to stabilize the shoulder joint are muscles and uh, one of the most important sets of muscles other than biceps brachii we're going to look at are the muscles that make up the rotator cuff and there are four muscles that make up the rotator cuff and it's a very important set of muscles because if you're a ball player like a baseball player I mean this is an area that gets injured quite quite easily so we're gonna go ahead jump a little bit into our muscle unit by going ahead and learning these rotator cuff muscles now it'll make your life a little bit easier later on so let's do that shall we okay so you know we're still kind of talking about the shoulder joint because these rotator cuff muscles are going to be part of the things that stabilize the shoulder joint. So I'm going to just go ahead and write here rotator cuff muscles. And again, there are four rotator cuff muscles. And what's so cool is that if you learned your landmarks of your scapula, this will be a piece of cake because the muscles sound so similar to the landmarks of the scapula. So let's go ahead and write some of these here. Um, so these, all of these rotator cuff muscles are going to attach to the scapula. So they're attaching to the scapula, but then from there, they are attaching to the humerus. So let's see. 
I'm going to just write a line there for attaching to the scapula. But from there, we're talking about attaching to the greater or lesser tubercles of the humerus. Tubercles of the humerus. Okay, and by doing that, by going from the scapula to the humerus, you're helping to stabilize that shoulder joint. So let's give this its own color and say equals help stabilize shoulder joint. Joint. Why did I not do that? Stabilize shoulder joint. Wow, I think I didn't have my pen very perpendicular there. Okay, so they help to stabilize the shoulder joint. So let's break these down into anterior muscles, means found on the anterior side of the scapula, versus the posterior side. Okay, so let's start off with the anterior. The anterior, there's only one that you have to know. So thinking back to their scapula, you learn that on the anterior side of the scapula, there's that nice flat-ish depression, and that was called the subscapular fossa, right? Remember that subscapular fossa? Well, there is a nice broad, flat muscle that covers that fossa, because often fossas are covered with muscle, and lo and behold, that muscle is called the subscapularis. So it is called the subscapularis. And so all of this is subscapularis covering the subscapular fossa on the anterior side of the scapula. So I'm going to make that a lighter color. So we are dealing with our subscapularis. Okay, and the subscapularis is the only one of these rotator cuff muscles that actually attaches to the lesser tubercle of the humerus. All the other ones attach to the greater tubercle. So this guy is going to attach from the scapula, from the subscapular fossa, to the lesser tubercle of the humerus. So to the lesser tubercle of the humerus. So that's the only one you need to know for the anterior view of the scapula. The other three rotator cuff muscles, and maybe I should make a note up here that there are four muscles here, one in the front, two, three in the back. Um, the other ones are kind of cool because they also sort of follow along these landmarks that you've already learned. So take a look over here at your posterior scapula. And you will remember this guy. Remember that guy? That is your spine, right? That's your scapular spine. And remember that the scapular spine divided the posterior scapula into your... So that spine divided your scapula into your supraspinous fossa and at the bottom your infraspinous fossa. So you had two depressions divided from each other by the spine. Well, the muscles <laughs> kind of follow that same trend. So above the spine, above the scapular spine, we're going to have supra, that means above, spinatus muscle. Lo and behold, the supraspinatus muscle covers the supraspinous fossa. And here he is over here. I don't know if they even use the same color to point him out. So there's your supraspinatus. And I guess I'll switch colors so that we can talk about the second one. And the second one is covering the infraspinous fossa. So all of this right here. And this guy is called your infraspinatus. Infra means below, spinatus muscle. And both of those babies are going to attach from the scapula to the greater tubercle of the humerus. So lots of stabilization there. So attach to the greater tubercle of the humerus. And finally, we got one other little guy over here, and I will make him orange. And he's a little guy right here. Do, 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 do. I know, right there. And that is Terra's minor. We'll deal with the, ma the major later on. We're in the minor leagues right now. This is the Terra's minor. And so you can see he's kind of sort of below the infraspinatus, 
muscle. So this is your teres minor muscle. And he also will be attaching to the greater tubercle of the humerus. Um, and so these guys are attached to the upper and lateral borders of the scapula and then attached to the greater, so I'll bring that down there, because he is also attached to the greater tubercle of the humerus. So all four of those rotator cuff muscles are going to work in tandem, attaching to those tubercles of the humerus, further stabilizing that shoulder joint, because this baby needs as much help as he possibly can get. Okay, what now? Well, there are so many other joints we could go over, um, but those are two of the most important ones, because those are, you know, the shoulder and the knee. I mean, those are two really, really important joints um, that always have problems with them. Well, what we want to do now is talk about some other joints, but I want to talk about them in conjunction with learning about the different kinds of movements that there are um, between joints. So let me just outline real quick these different kinds of movements, and then we're going to see them in action in some little videos. Okay, the last main concept we need to go over are the movements of the body. And so these are the ways that we actually move our joints. Because you know, your muscles contract, but what's really moving, if you think about it, is your joint. Your the two main kinds of movements you think about, like let's say you're lifting weights to work your biceps, well, you're actually flexing. They say you flex your muscle, but you're really flexing your joint. So we have flexion, and the opposite of that would be extension. So flexion and extension. So the key to flexion is that you are decreasing the angle. So imagine you have, and I don't know if you can see this in the camera, but imagine your arm is outstretched. So almost 180 degrees, right? It's straight. If I start flexing by contracting my biceps muscle, then I have decreased that angle. So I've made it less than 180. So flexion, you are going less than 180 degrees. You are decreasing the angle. And the opposite would be true for extension. You're increasing the angle until it becomes straight. Hyperextension would mean you're going beyond that 180. So uh, for example, with my head, you know, here's my head straight. If I bring it down, I'm flexing it because I've decreased the angle. If I bring it up, I'm extending it. And if I look at the ceiling, I'm actually hyper extending it. Don't want to do too much of that. Like if, you, if it happens from trauma of getting rear-ended in the car, that's called whiplash, right? So, so we have flexion and extension. So you can see this dude is flexing his bicep and extending his bicep. So flexion, extension in this case. And you can flex and extend your legs, a whole bunch of things, right? So it just means decreasing or increasing that angle. Now, um, here's another common turn, term. Uh, I will make a different color. Abduction versus adduction. So abduction. Think of like if someone gets abducted, hopefully not, but if someone gets abducted, they're being taken away, right? So in abduction, you're moving away from the midline of the body. So if I went like this, I'm abducting. If I came back, I'm adducting. You can do this with your fingers too. So here's my sagittal plane down the middle. So we're going to just hold the third finger straight. But if I look at fingers 5, 4, and 2, and 1, I'm abducting them right now. I'll hold, i got to hold this finger straight. It keeps trying to move. Abducting, because it's going away from the midline, versus adducting, they're going back towards the midline. So Abduction, we'll just put this here. So abduction, abduction is move away from the midline. It says away from the midline versus adduction would be going towards the midline. Coming down a little bit here, ah, rotations. So medial rotation versus lateral rotation. You can think of this with your legs. You could also think of it with your arm in a sense. So imagine your leg is here. If you're rotating your leg, imagine this is my leg in, that would be medial rotation because it's towards the middle. It went out, that would be lateral rotation. Um, there's uh, circumduction I could do with my arm or I'm going like this, right? So that's circumduction. 
Um, this one's, these ones are kind of my favorites here. Supination versus pronation. So this is dealing with your forearm here. Um, so with your forearm, you know, you have your ulna and your radius. And so when you're in anatomical position, if you guys can see that, if you're in anatomical position, your ulna and your radius are actually parallel to each other. And in this position, you are supinated. You've done supination because you can hold a bowl of soup. Think of it that way. So supination, you're holding a bowl of soup. You're in anatomical position. But if I turn my palms over, I am now in pronation. So pronation, supination. And the interesting thing is when you pronate, your radius literally crosses over your ulna, which is interesting. So in supination, they're parallel. Pronation, the radius crosses over the ulna. Um, what else do we got here? Ah, elevation versus depression. And, you know, you can do this with your jaw. Um, you also tend to use these terms when you're talking about your scapulae because if you shrug your shoulders, you are elevating your scapulae, and if you drop your shoulders, you are depressing your scapulae. If I open my jaw, I'm depressing it, depressing the mandible. If I close it, then I am elevating my jaw. Ah, up, ah, up. I can also protrude my jaw by sticking it forward. So I'll show you a video with a model that is much better at showing these things. Um, and then with the feet, we got dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So uh, dorsiflexion, the dorsal part of your foot is obviously the top here. So if you bring it up, kind of like you're walking on your heels, so walk on heels, um, that is dorsiflexion. You're flexing your foot with the dorsal part, the upper part of your foot, kind of going up. Um, if you start to put your foot down and step on your tippy toes, so I'll put tip e toes, then you are doing plantar flexion. Plantar is the bottom of your foot. So think of your planting it down. So you're walking on your tippy toes, you, that is plantar flexion. Uh, two of the terms not listed here are inversion versus eversion, also dealing with feet. So for both dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, and inversion, eversion, we're dealing with feet. Um, inversion, and I was going to bring my baby here to, to illustrate, but she's, she's taking a nap. Um, imagine these are her feet, and this is the dorsal part of her foot. This is the plantar part of her foot or sole. If she lifts her foot like this so that her uh, soles of her feet are facing each other, that's called inversion. If she does it the other way so the outside of her feet are pointed up um, and the soles of her feet are kind of facing either side, that's eversion. So I will show you videos of all of this. But these are um, general action terms for movements. And so when we start to talk about muscles in the next unit, we'll talk about what is the muscle's action? How does it move? And you'll say, okay, it flexes the lower arm or it, you know, um, it pronates the forearm, you know, so if you can kind of learn these terms now, it'll help you. So let's take a look at a series of little videos that will introduce you a little more to some of these other joints and allow you to see what kinds of movements are possible in these joints. We're going to start with the intervertebral joints um, and then go into a little more specific with the cervical joints so you'll kind of see the different movements possible with those. We'll go over the mandibular joint called the temporomandibular joint or TMJ. We're going to go over some of the joints of the upper limb like the scapula, glenohumeral joint which you've already already familiar with, um, some of the forearm and the hand, and then some of the lower limb joints. So let's take a look at them. Intervertebral joints are formed by articulations between vertebral bodies, united by an intervertebral disc, and between adjacent superior and inferior articular processes. Flexion of intervertebral joints occurs when bending the trunk forward, for example, to pick up something from the ground. Extension of intervertebral joints occurs when straightening the trunk, for example, after picking up something on the ground. 
This is one we didn't talk about yet, lateral flexion and extinct, lateral. extension. So this is just where you're turning either your head from side to side, which would be with the cervical invertebral joints you'll see in a minute, or in the case they're about to show you, your whole body. But either way, your vertebrae are involved, and which is why it's under the intervertebral joints category. Flexion of intervertebral joints results in lateral or sideways bending of the trunk and or neck, for example, when leaning sideways to grasp the handle of a suitcase. Rotation of intervertebral joints occurs as the trunk and or neck turns to okay, one side so now let's or the see other. It specific to the cervical vertebrae, which is mainly dealing with how you move your head. Intervertebral joints are formed by articulations between vertebral bodies, united by an intervertebral disc, and between adjacent superior and inferior articular processes. Flexion of cervical vertebrae occurs when one bows the head or looks downward. Extension of cervical vertebrae occurs when one returns the bowed head to anatomical Here's position. Extension. Hyperextension of cervical vertebrae occurs when one looks upward from anatomical position. Forceful hyperextension or whiplash may occur in a rear end car crash. Lateral flexion of cervical vertebrae results in lateral or sideways bending of the trunk and or neck. For example, as okay, occurs during so typical stretching exercises. I think you got a general idea of how movements occur around intervertebral joints. Let's check out our TMJ, our temporomandibular joint. That means the joint between the temporal bone and the mandib mandible. And you'll remember the head of the mandibular condyle and the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone is where this is at. The temporomandibular joint, or TMJ, is the articulation between the head of the mandible and the mandibular fossa and the articular tubercle of the temporal bone. Depression of the mandible opens the mouth. Elevation of the mandible closes the mouth. Protrusion of the mandible moves the mandible anteriorly or forward. Retraction of the mandible moves the protruded mandible posteriorly. So that's something I forgot backward. to mention. So I, I mentioned position. protrusion, where you're kind of shoving your mandible forward, but the opposite of protrusion is retraction, where you're putting it back. So all these things always come in pairs. Let's check out the scapula. The scapula does not have a bony articulation with the axial skeleton. Its movement affects the upper limb and is controlled by scapular muscles. Elevation of the scapula raises the shoulders, for example, when one shrugs the shoulders. Depression of the scapula lowers the shoulders. For example, when one's shoulders sag. Protraction of the scapula moves the shoulder forward. For example, pushing oars forward during rowing. Retraction of the scapula pulls the shoulders backward. For example, pulling oars toward the body during rowing. Upward rotation of the scapula directs the glenoid cavity superiorly or upward, as occurs during abduction of the arm. Downward rotation of the scapula directs the glenoid cavity inferiorly, as when okay, lowering so the arm from above the head. so you can see the, the scapula head. is moving in multiple directions there. Um, let's check out the shoulder joint right here, so you can see all the different ways that this guy moves. 
The glenohumeral joint is the articulation between the glenoid fossa of the scapula and the head of the humerus. Flexion of the glenohumeral joint occurs when the upper limb moves anteriorly, for example, swinging the arm when walking. Extension of the glenohumeral joint occurs when the upper limb moves posteriorly, for example, swinging the arm when walking. Abduction of the glenohumeral joint moves the upper limb away from the body in the coronal plane, for example, during jumping jacks. Adduction of the glenohumeral joint moves the upper limb toward the body in the coronal plane, adduction, adduction, for example, adduction, adduction. during jumping jacks. Medial rotation of the glenohumeral joint turns the anterior aspect of the arm toward the body midline. Lateral rotation of the glenohumeral joint turns the anterior aspect of the arm away from the body midline. Circumduction of the glenohumeral joint moves the upper limb in a circular pattern, for example, when swimming the backstroke. Okay, so you can see that the glenohumeral joint does a lot, so hence multi-axial. So we're going to go over a couple more of these. Um, I want to do the elbow joint, and I want to do um, the radio ulnar joint because I think it's very interesting, and then also some of the of the ones of the finger and the knee, and then we'll call it a day. The elbow joint is formed by the articulations between the trochlear notch of the ulna and the trochlea of the humerus and the head of the radius and the capitulum of the humerus. Flexion of the elbow joint bends the elbow, for example, during weightlifting or bringing a cup to the mouth. Extension of the elbow joint straightens the elbow, for example, when reaching for an object okay. with the upper limb. Uh, let's do radial ulnar joint. The radial ulnar joint is formed by the proximal and distal articulations of the radius with the ulna. From the anatomical position, pronation so rotates the radius forearm over so the that ulna the palm faces pronated. posteriorly. From the pronated position, supination Another rotates parallel. the forearm so that the palm faces anteriorly. From the supinated position, with the elbow flexed, pronation rotates the forearm so that the palm faces downward. From the pronated position, with the elbow flexed, supination rotates the forearm okay. so that the now palm I want faces to do upward. Carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb, CMC. Very interesting um, because you're actually dealing with the thumb directly tying into a carpal bone. And then we're going to do the knee. The carpometacarpal or CMC joint of the thumb is formed by the articulation between the trapezium and the base of the first metacarpal. Flexion of the carpometacarpal or CMC joint of the thumb moves the digit medially in the plane of the palm. Flexion of the interphalangeal or IP joint of the thumb, which is not shown, or bending the joint also occurs in the same plane. Extension of the carpometacarpal or CMC joint of the thumb moves the digit laterally in the plane of the palm. Extension of the interphalangeal or IP joint that is, straightening the thumb, which is not shown, also occurs in the same plane. Abduction of the carpal metacarpal or CMC joint of the thumb moves the digit anteriorly in a plane perpendicular to the palm, for example, when one prepares to grasp an object in the hand. Adduction of the carpal metacarpal or CMC joint of the thumb 
moves the digit posteriorly in a plane perpendicular to the palm. For example, when making a fist oh, cool. or grasping an object in the hand. Opposition is the movement of the carpal metacarpal or CMC joint of the thumb and to a lesser extent the little finger that results in touching of the pads of these So this digits. is kind of cool. So you've heard as primates we have position. opposable thumbs. That's what they're talking about. You can go like this. So you can grab tree branches. How cool is that? Reposition is the movement of the carpal metacarpal or CMC joint of the thumb and to a lesser extent the little finger that returns the opposed thumb and little finger to their anatomical positions. Okay, so the one more, let's just do the knee opposition. since we spent a lot of time talking about the knee. But uh, notice there's a few more here. Um, I encourage you to go on to AP Revealed and, and view all of these because it's fascinating and it'll help you when you're studying the muscles. So here's the knee. The knee joint is the articulation between the condyles of the femur and tibia and between the femur and the patella. The fibula does not participate in this joint. Flexion of the knee joint bends the knee, for example, when squatting or kicking. Extension of the knee joint straightens the knee, for example, when kicking. Okay, so there you have it. You've learned all about joints. You learned about the functional categories of them. Do you remember what those were? Diarthroses, amphiarthroses, and synarthroses. And you learned about the structural categories of them. So we had fibrous joints, we had cartilaginous joints, and we had synovial joints. And then you'll remember that there were six subcategories of synovial joints. We also learned about the different types of movements of these joints. So with that, I think you're ready to move on to muscle. Muscles and lab gets so fun when muscles, we're going to start dissecting things. But even lecture, we'll be dissecting things because we'll be making extensive use of AP Revealed and doing virtual dissections. So I can't wait and I will see you in unit three.